You are listening to the Lead Big Red podcast from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Educational Administration Department with your hosts, Dr. Shavana Holman and Dr. Scott Sturgeon. Welcome to the very first Lead Big Red podcast. I am Scott Sturgeon, Assistant Professor of Practice at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the Educational Administration Department. My co-host is... Shavana Holman. I'm also an Assistant Professor of Practice in the Educational Administration Department, and we are joined today by uh, Dr. Nick Pace, the chair of our department. Welcome, Dr. Pace. Good morning, Dr. Sturgeons, Dr. Holman. Happy to be with you. Thanks so much for inviting me. This is this is really exciting. It's exciting for us as well. Um, yes. If if we could start off with just uh, if Dr. Pace, you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, it's my uh, privilege to serve as the chair of the Department of Educational Administration. Uh, as Dr. Holman said, uh, this is my fourth year at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, former, uh, former social worker, teacher, um, coach, principal. Um, prior to my time here at Nebraska, I was at uh, the University of Northern Iowa for 17 years as a faculty member and uh, program coordinator, and, and uh, they call it a department head. Um, and uh, just uh, really, really honored to uh, be in the role uh, that I serve to support students and faculty and um, leadership is a, a passion of mine, uh, which doesn't mean, which is not to say I'm an expert on it, uh, but I, I just, uh, I know how important effective leadership is and, and uh, contributing to uh, the success of scholars and leaders uh, through our programs here at Nebraska is, uh, is a real joy. Fantastic. That's a great segue into my first question for you. What would you consider to be your best attributes as a leader? Wow. Um, exchanges like this are sort of hard because it can sound like you're, you know, talking yourself up or, you know, whatever. Um, I think that one of my uh, strengths is um, I I, I try really hard to be fully present. I try really hard to be all in. Uh, I think a lot of it is about, um, you know, being all in for other people and, and their success and their opportunities. Uh, years ago, when I was a when I was a high school teacher, I was a member of the Optimist Club in the town where we where we lived, and and I don't remember we would meet on Friday mornings for breakfast, and I don't remember all of the Optimist Creed, but one of the creed, a part of it that we would recite uh, was to be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own, and I have kept that or tried to keep that um, w- with me to uh, just you know be fully present enthusiastic about the success of others, uh, try to support it, um, and, and be um, just as, as um, mindful of that and as committed uh, to other people and knowing them as people uh, beyond students, beyond faculty members, beyond principals, superintendents, higher ed administrators, whatever they are, but, but also appreciate that, you know, behind that, uh, behind that title, uh, is a is a person with uh, skills and talents and joys and fears and pain and and humanity. Thank you. Great. Um, and so you don't uh, feel like you've been bragging about yourself. The next question will help out with that, which is, um, <laughs> whose work in education are you following right now, or that you're reading right now? Somebody you're leaning on. Oh boy. Um, well, I'm reading uh, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, which which isn't uh, exclusively a leadership book, um, although if you're not attending to and aware of you know and concerned about and and struggling with issues of equity and justice and opportunity and racism individually systemically etc., uh, then I don't know what you're doing. Um, and so you know Wilkerson's book is is. Uh, is a tough read in terms of, uh, you know, acknowledging things that have gotten us uh, to some of the challenges um, that we're that we're dealing with. Um, but I really, uh, I really, really enjoying the read. Um, 
I really, uh, I really like uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, I, I really have enjoyed his uh, leaders. Uh, I think his leaders eat last. Um, that really approaches leadership from a, a service orientation. I think at the end of the day, leadership is service to others. Period. Um, there are a lot of components to it, but it, I think for me, if you boil it down, that's that's a lot of it. Um, Scott, I like anything by Bowman and Deal. Um, <clears throat> I find reframing organizations to be really valuable. Um, I think F. Scott Fitzgerald said that the mark of an intelligent person is someone who can hold two competing ideas in their head at the same time. Um, and I think Bowman and Deal sort of get at that through those four frames of leadership. You know, there's the symbolic and the human relations and the structural and how do all those things come together and um, you know, I think if leaders are only attending to one piece of the problem, there's a whole lot that's going to be missed. Um, so I, I, I think uh, Bowman and Deal do a, a nice job with that. Um, I'm a big Parker Palmer fan. Uh, I try to read anything by Parker Palmer. Um, I just find that he's uh, um, got such a sense of balance and um, – you know, his place and his role in, in the world and um, uh, sort of the reasons why we do some of the things that we do. Uh, I'm just really a fan of uh, Parker Palmer. And the other person I really, uh, one of the other people I really enjoy is uh, Margaret Wheatley. Um, mm -hmm. I read an article uh, by, by Wheatley. Uh, it's a 2011 article. It's called From Hero to Host. Um, leadership in the age of complexity. And um, I, I have really, really um, benefited from that. So I, um, it's a dangerous question because I can always probably throw <laughs> out five or six books that I'm not finished with. Right. Uh, I'm reading Obama's book, Promised Land right now, which is terrific, uh, terrific read. Uh, I read a lot of Sharon Salzberg also. Uh, Sharon Salzberg is a mindfulness meditation um, guru. So I I got five or six that are somewhere between this far and this far off the ground. Right. You're right. That's good. People, people like to, to pick other people's brains, or at least I do about what they're reading and who, who gets them excited about whatever part of the world that they're thinking about, uh, whether professional or personal. So, uh, thanks a lot for that. Yeah. Great. So you mentioned a little bit about what it means to be a leader, um, to you. And in general, there are some different thoughts and ideas and definitions that float out um, around and about about leadership as it relates to education in particular. And so can you share with us what you would think or what your true definition of leadership is um, as it relates to education? Yeah, boy, what what a what a good question. Um, I was reflecting on this a little bit because I, I anticipated that you'd come at me with some kind of request for a definition or components of, of leadership. Um, and I think one of the awesome things about the, the podcast and the project that you're doing is going to be uh, your, fo your listeners and viewers will hear so many different answers to that question and none of them is going to be wrong. Right. Uh, you know, we all have a different take and a different set of strengths and a different perspective. And um, boy, you, you reflect on that and boil it down together and you're going to have a world of ideas. Um, there are a couple of things for, for me. Um, one is, um, I think it's really important for uh, leaders to have a, a, a sense of perspective. Um, what is the big picture? Um, what is the ultimate goal? Um, what is the overall trajectory of what we're doing um, or what we're trying to do? Uh, I'll out myself uh, and say that like a lot of people, I, I, have, uh, I struggle with perfectionism. Um, and so I have to be real careful about not having um, perfect be the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm figuring out what, what, what really can be good enough and what needs to be good enough and what has to be perfect. Um, because everything can't be perfect. That that's a recipe for burnout and disaster and, 
and unhappiness and, and some other things. Um, so a big picture perspective, I think, is important. Um, I have a I have a goal statement uh, on my on my wall here in front of my desk that that kind of helps me uh, try to maintain that perspective. Um, being fully present is a second component to it. I mentioned that earlier. Um, I used to call it, I used to refer to it as mindfulness, but um, to me, it's more being fully present, trying to be present in, in, in every interaction, trying to uh, really listen to what the issues are, um, listen to understand. You know, the Stephen Covey stuff about seek first to understand. Uh, don't listen to make a point don't listen to win an argument. Don't think about what you're about to say next while the other person is explaining or presenting or speaking. Um, be right there. Uh, that's a work in progress, um, especially in a multitasking world where there's so many things coming at once. Um, you know, I'm, I'm making notes while I'm checking email and attending a Zoom meeting. That's not, that's not good stuff. Uh, so I think, you know, presence um, whether it's with students, whether it's at a conference, whether it's uh, in a difficult conversation with somebody, whether it's working on a project. Um, and then service. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. The, the third, a third component for me is, is uh, service to others. And, um, you know, that's a commitment to the overall trajectory. Um, it's a commitment to progress. Um, very little of it happens as quickly as I want it to, or very, very little of it happens as quickly as I think it perhaps should. And what I mean by that is sometimes I think that I should be able to move it along quicker, whatever it is. Um, and in one sense, I think that's a good thing probably for leaders to have, and you need a little bit of impatience and certainly a lot of passion to maintain some energy and keep things moving in a good direction. Um, but there's also a danger that it's never enough or it's never fast enough or the impact is never significant enough or the progress is not life-changing enough. Um, and so, you know, leave it better than you found it. If I can leave it, whatever it is, the organization, the program, the people, the experience, if I can leave that better than I found it in a market, in a, in a, significant way, then whoever's in whatever the role is after me is going to bring a new set of skills and talents and passions and abilities that I don't have. And um, they're going to pick it up and, and, and move it forward in a more um, new and exciting way that I could never have done. Um, I shared with the faculty, Dr. Holman may remember this, Scott, uh, Dr. Sturgeon, it was before you were here. Uh, I took a picture one day of a phone pole uh, out on 14th Street that I walked past when I'd come out of the parking garage on my way to work. And the phone pole is, it's an old weathered crack pole and it's got all kinds of staples and nails and rusty, you know, uh, things attached to it from signs and notices and announcements and lost cats. And there's a concert and there's a speaker and there's a, you know, whatever going on over years and years and years and years, they've been on that, stapled to that pole. And um, all that's left are those rusty staples and nails for whatever the very important announcement was that they were you know, sharing. And I, I was just thinking about that in terms of each of those things posted on that pole were really important in that moment to somebody. But now, we don't know what all the outcomes of those things were, but just those staples and nails are left. And so that reminds me of, and this maybe goes back to perspective, that reminds me that I get to serve in this uh, leadership role for a limited period of time. I don't know, you know what that time is, but we're all here for a limited period of time. And so uh, I got to, I got to be mindful that I'm benefiting from the good work of lots and lots of people that was uh, done before I ever arrived. And the people who are coming later will benefit from uh, the, the things that we're doing now. 
um, and have to clean up some of the things that we're not doing well now and that I'm not doing very effectively now. And that's all part of it. Um, and I think a final thing about service is that done effectively, many of or most of the people who benefit won't even know what happened because it was just taken care of. I think a lot of leadership is eliminating obstacles and trying to keep things out of the way um, from people doing good work. Uh, and so if a lot of those things get handled effectively, no one even knows that there was a lot of work that went in to prepare that ground or to, to let those things happen. Um, so that, that, that may be the, the rambling lead big red podcast record for a <laughs> twisting answer to your leadership question, but that's what I've got. No, it's great though, because as you were talking, um, it made me reflect about, because I know you and I are very similar in, in some of our thoughts and ideologies and, and just in our, our, our processing of things and, and wanting to be perfect. And um, so it was a great reminder for me as I listened to you and, and hear some of the encouraging words that you have shared. So thank you. Yeah, great question. And, and it's, it wasn't a setup, your answer. I know it wasn't a setup to the next question, but you're going to, uh, but I appreciated it because you brought up uh, in your answer uh, to that, to that question, uh, three themes that are part of our program, uh, visionary thinkers, servant uh, leaders, and reflective learners. And in those three things, what right now, which one of those, uh, those three areas right now are you finding most needed in your work? Uh, supporting, um, whether it's EDD candidates, uh, supporting students in the MED program, or in your work supporting leaders um, outside, uh, whether it's school districts, ESU, superintendents that come to you or that you are, are connecting with. So which one of those three uh, are you finding um, most needed right now or most useful right now? Wow, that is a, that is a terrific question. Um, I'm not sure I can identify one more than the others, um, Scott. Uh, visionary, the last 10, 11 months uh, has been so challenging and so unique in so many ways with, uh, you know, uh, of course, the pandemic and racial justice, racism, anti-racism efforts, um, economic collapse, uh, and, and on all of those kind of things. And what are the impacts on educators and, and, and education, whether you're talking preschoolers or you know, higher education professionals or, or higher ed leaders, superintendents, principals. I don't think we know what all of the impacts of this current environment are gonna be in terms of you know, uh, what, what's school gonna look like? What's higher ed gonna look like? What should it look like? What, you know, what things have we not thought of? And just clearing some space so that there can be some reflection and some vision about optimizing systems and what could and should things look like. Um, I think that's a, I think that's a challenge. Um, I think there will be on the other side, some good things that will, um, that will come from these challenges. Um, I think it's going to be a heavy lift to get there um, as, as it always is. Um, you know, I, I think of uh, our work with, with uh, EDD students, you know, that's a practitioner's degree and we encourage people to think about a problem or an opportunity that they want to address as a scholar or a leader. Um, and so, you know, there's a visionary aspect of that to um, that dissertation doesn't necessarily have to be a traditional five chapter document it might, take, uh, it might take a form that's very different. It might be a professional development or mentoring program for new teachers somewhere. It might be a, uh, it might be a protocol or program that helps uh, you know, students of color, uh, first generation kids achieve success on college and university campuses. It might be a million things. Those are just, that's a small example of you know, the need for some, some vision. Um, in order to, create that space, I think you have to be very reflective, which is the second, uh, second component or second core competency to our P12 program that, that the faculty has, has uh, 
coalesced around. Um, and I think it's really hard uh, in our current environment to be reflective um, because there's so much coming at us. Um, and just knowing when to step back or how, uh, you know, and, and whether it's where do you find that space and time to be reflective? Is it early morning, late at night, in the woods, on the water, um, in your car, uh, walking the dog, in prayer, meditation? I don't know, but I think it's really important for each of us to understand where we can do that work, do that reflection that's really important. Um, and then, you know, service. Um, I kind of think of it in terms of leadership and management. And sometimes uh, in, in principal or, or in school leader training, some people will present um, management as distinct or different from or in competition, you know, with leadership. And, you know, I, um, I know that districts, you know, a lot of people have said districts will choose uh, a, a lesser leader if they're sure somebody can just run the building and handle the management stuff. I also think that's changing because I have so many superintendents uh, and, and higher ed folks say to me, we've got to have leaders. We've got to have people that can generate followers, that can set a course, that have empathy and passion, and they can listen because we can find a lot of people who can ring the bells, serve the lunches at school, get kids on the bus, build the schedule and all of those things. And so I, I feel like the leadership and the management aren't in there in an ideal way. They're not in competition with each other. They should be connected and, and complementary. Um, you know, so the way I handle a crisis or something really intense or really difficult, folks should be able to sort of anticipate what that's going to look like based on, you know, the leadership that a person demonstrates. So um, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but I, I think they're closely related for the people who do it well. Uh, you know, I don't know anybody that goes through their days, well, I'm managing right now and I'm going to manage for 37 minutes. And then when I get done, I'm going to go lead. You know, it's, it's all kind of, you know, melded together. And as we prepare leaders and administrators, um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of art and a lot of science together, I think. For sure. <laughs> sure. It's not, not simple at all. <laughs> no, no. But, but that's what makes it so much fun. Uh, and so complicated and so difficult. I, I have said to hundreds and hundreds of students, this thing that we're studying called leadership, I will argue, is in fact more complicated than rocket science. And people say, well, it's not rocket science. No, it's more complicated than rocket science because it's people, human behavior, and unique context. I mean, rocket science is, is, is obviously really complicated, but if you have the budget, like Elon Musk and SpaceX, <laughs> you can hire the engineers, purchase the raw materials, and launch the rocket. They do it all the time. There's a playbook for how to do it. I would argue that leadership is more, com is more complicated because it's human behavior, it's race, gender, class, ethnicity, uh, racism, tolerance, love, peace, hate, power, past experience, language, ethnicity, sexual orientation, budget. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a million things. And there is no playbook. <laughs> and there is no playbook. I think there are some key practices and, and components, but uh, yeah, so much art and science crashing together. Whereas that rocket, and with all this, with with all due respect to rocket scientists, that's mostly hard science. It appears to me you got to get the team to work together, and you have to have people comfortable speaking up when something's not working, like the O rings on the shuttle uh, that I think this week was the was the cha uh, the Challenger, Challenger disaster, the yeah. anniversary. 
and you know I've read the the research about how you know folks weren't comfortable speaking up and the awful awful result. So uh, so complicated. All yeah. right. Thank well, you. Speaking of complicated, I'm going to throw one more complicated question your way. <laughs> so. You've mentioned all the things that you've been um, prior to your position right now. You've been a teacher leader. You've been a building leader. You've been or are currently a leader in higher education. Which one would you say um, that you have had the most impact in and why? And which one has impacted you the most and why? Uh, Boy. That is tough. Um, My first job out of college was with the Missouri Department of Mental Health. I was a social worker uh, in Kansas City, uh, working with uh, folks with serious and chronic mental illnesses who a generation before would have been um, in an institution. Uh, And they were navigating with various degrees of success in, in the toughest parts of the city with very few advantages. That had a tremendous impact on me uh, as as a young person, new out of college. Um, Serving as principal uh, had a huge impact on me, uh, partly because uh, it became apparent uh, to me the things that I wasn't good at and the skills that I lacked in order to uh, effectively lead the the students and the the teachers and, and the community. Um, and so that takes me to your first question. Um, I hope that, um, as one who was teaching future leaders, or I'm actually more comfortable saying as somebody who was working to facilitate the learning of future leaders, because I think it happens together. I'm probably a, you know, constructivist or, you know, we'll figure this out together at heart. But um, I hope that I have had a a significant impact on future leaders, um, helping them discover their strengths and talents and their growth areas, um, helping them watch out for things that uh, became a problem for me, um, such as life balance such as perfection, such as uh, perhaps standards that are not reasonable, at least from, you know, standards put on myself and and maybe others that aren't reasonable. Um, And so, you know, one of the things that I think all leaders try to process through is um, where can I best use my talents and passions and, you know, in the, in the position that I have now, um, I deal directly with fewer students in terms of facilitating their learning and helping them grow. Um, but I hope that the things that we're doing as a, as a team um, enhance their growth and opportunities and, and, and provide good experiences and uh, really game changing experiences uh, for, for people because, you know, higher ed, um, research, higher ed administration, P12 school leadership, none of those things. That's not for everybody. Um, and so, you know, preparing people to be successful um, and be connected to others and have a support system and be grounded and um, have the confidence and the humanity or humility to uh, reach out to somebody and say, Hey, this is what I'm facing. This is what I'm thinking. And I need some help because I've got nothing. I'm not sure where to go. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I have through the various roles been able to create some conditions for things like that to happen for folks. I, I hope so. Thank you. So kind of along that lines of facilitation. One of the things that uh, educators love to do is to give people books. So earlier I asked you what you were reading. So a a question um, that I love, I'm stealing kind of an idea from from one of my favorite uh, podcasters, Tim Ferriss, which is what's the book that you gift the most 
or what's the book that you recommend the most to new leaders? Oh boy. You know, it, it depends. Uh, I, I have given, uh, I have given Dean Smith's book, A Coach's Life, uh, to some young coaches that I know. Right. Um, I have given uh, Amit Sud. Amit Sud is uh, a, a researcher at the Mayo Clinic. I have given his book, um, the, Mayo Clinic Guide, the Mayo Clinic Guide to Stress-Free Living. Mm-hmm. I have passed that one on a few times. Um, I have given uh, Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer a number of times. Um, Also passed on his book, uh, On the Brink of Everything. I gave that one to my parents. (laughs) I don't don't know if they can find it at this moment, but I did send it to them. Um, And I don't know, Scott, maybe maybe where I'm going to try to answer the question is, if I am uh, present enough, I will perhaps have a sense of what this particular person is working on, what they're good at, what their challenges are. And if I have read something or encountered something that maybe aligns with that, I can pass it on to them. Um, But I'll also say that a really important thing for me, and this is something that Palmer says, um, no fixing, advising, guiding, uh, excuse me, no fixing, advising, directing, or saving. Right. Folks figure stuff out on their time. And the answers and the path forward is theirs. And so I also try to be, you know, mindful of that. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's difficult. Because like we all, right, we all have ideas for, well, if you just do this, you know, whether it's our friend dealing with some relationship thing or, you know, a family situation or whether it's a professional issue, uh, well, well, just do this. I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to direct you. I'm going to fix you, save you from yourself, whatever. Um, I really like Palmer's uh, guidance there. And I try to, I try to pass that on. Um, or I try to be mindful of that and, and, and be careful to not, you know, direct. Uh, this week, funny you asked, this week I shared uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, uh, with, a, with a friend of mine. Um, and that was, that, that was a little bit difficult because I, uh, I, I, believe that, I believe that Kipling was racist. And I find that that particular poem has, has shown me a lot of things and has taught me a lot of things. And, and I thought the context fit for this friend of mine that I, that I passed right. it on to. Um, so, I, you know, I, I try, to, try to maybe pass things on if they, think if, if they think it fits. And that might be the Lead Big Red podcast or it might be a Parker Palmer <laughs> book. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of a conversation I would have um, when, when I was supervising principals a lot, which was a principal can ans- can answer just about every question that a staff member is going to ask them as they walk up and down the halls, but they shouldn't for a number of reasons, one of which because people have more agency than they give themselves credit for, and yeah. your job is to help them find that. So that's one, one thing, and it fits that whole idea of balance and overwhelm. Um, but the other reason is that you might not be the best person to answer it right now, given what other priorities you might have. Yeah. So I think about the number of ways in which we get lost uh, on our own way down the hall towards whatever important thing we had planned, because we can be the one who can answer all of the questions. Yeah. And then that translates into so many things, whether you're coaching a teacher, whether you're coaching a staff member or, or, or coaching a student, even um, getting out of the way of their own um, agency and ability to find the answers themselves with the support that you might be able to offer them. Uh, but, but simply, you know, just because yeah. you can't answer every question, not, not, yeah. um, not doing that, 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 um, 
your love reference it. is really interesting for that. So love it. I, I, that reminds me of uh, when I was a young when I was a young uh, high school teacher and basketball coach. Uh, I, I was a basketball player uh, at Northern Iowa, and uh, my college coach Eldon Miller uh, has been probably as as uh, a, much of a guiding force in my life in terms of what to do and life and how to live it, and how to treat folks uh, as anybody outside of my parents. Um, and I called coach coach one day and I was just really frustrated and, you know, kind of dealing with some career opportunities and I wasn't sure what to do. And, and I ran through it with coach and I said, well, coach, what would you do if you were me? And he kind of paused and he said, well, I'm not you, so I don't know. And I was really frustrated (laughs) Because I wanted him to tell me in that moment, and I was going to go do what coach said to do. I, I'd have done it that afternoon. And, and I was frustrated, but he said exactly what I needed him to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah, I think that gets to your point. You know, and it, 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 my affinity for Parker Palmer kind of relates to your point, Scott, about folks figure it out on yeah. their time. And I figured that out after the conversation with coach and I'm still trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. Great. Great lessons from both of you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so the other night you sat in on my internship class, um, students who are in their very last course, um, get ready to go out into the world to become future school leaders, district administrators, and so on and so forth. So much fun. And during that class, they participated in some uh, virtual reality, virtual reality simulations um, thrown into a situation where they had to engage with this avatar, um, this real life humanistic avatar. And um, it was a really, really great experience from all, for all of them from what they um, mentioned to me. And I was just wondering, as someone that's sat in that class and someone who um, is a practicing leader, what words of encouragement would you have for those students or anyone else who is considering going into school leadership, especially in this day and age? Oh boy. Yeah. That was such a great exercise and such a great experience to, for the students and, and one to watch. Um, I think that I would want uh, those students to know that they have more talent and more ability than they may think they do. Um, I think that they, uh, I would encourage them to look at their role, uh, you know, well, as uh, look at their role as expanding their influence or expanding their impact. And, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, teachers, and, and I'm sure that you both do too, and many of them will say, well, I'm not sure I'm ready to leave the classroom. I'm not sure I'm ready to leave my students. I'm not sure I'm ready to give up uh, my instructional coaching role or my athletics coaching role or whatever it is. Uh, and I think the great ones uh, see it sort of as a redirection of their energies. Um, and, you know, the teaching, the coaching, the the encouraging, the giving it a try, that's really the same as you move into leadership opportunities. It's just the audience and the setting is maybe a little different. Um, I think generally, uh, and this is one of the things I really love about our programs, both in higher ed and P12 here, our students don't come to us wanting a a document to hang on the wall. My experience is our students come to Nebraska because they want to be challenged, they want to be supported, and they want to grow their skills and they want impact. There are a lot of places, you know, folks can can um, acquire a, a, a credential or a, you know move on the pay scale, whatever the whatever the thought is. Um, but I think uh, I, I I think. I heard on a podcast. Uh, someone was advising, start before you're ready. Take a breath and just lean in a little bit and start before you're ready. Because if you wait until you're completely ready, you'll probably never do it, whatever it is. Beginning a relationship, 
taking a new position, making some kind of move, uh, whatever. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, Siobhan, I would encourage them to think about their gifts, their talents and their passions and uh, how to how to maximize those. Um, you know, that imposter syndrome is a risk for everybody. You know, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not whatever enough. Um, but, you know, um, ships weren't made for the harbor. And uh, I would I would want those folks to believe that they have more talent and gifts and opportunities than perhaps they realize. And there is no question that we need them now. Absolutely. Across P20, we need folks. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I know you've you've done. Uh, uh, throughout your career is right. Uh, written a couple of books. One is being updated right now. Um, if you would um, choose a book, whether it's the one you're, you're updating right now or, um, and just talk a little bit about when you, when you are writing, whether it's an article, a book, whatever, when you're writing, um, do you have a particular uh, audience in mind um, every time that you're always thinking of that one person or that one teacher or that one educator that you're thinking of, or is each uh, one unique uh, to the situation that you might be uh, trying to construct? Yeah, that's a great question. And a very dangerous question, Dr. Sturgeon, because you ask, a, you ask somebody in higher ed to talk about the stuff they've written and uh, <laughs> it may go a while. <laughs> um, so I have been, I've been fortunate to write uh, four books about principles and preparing principles and the principalship. And each of the four has been directed at somebody who aspires to be a principal and to help them do a better job. That, that's, that's the audience. That's the person that I've, that I've um, tried, to, tried to get at. Um, the, the book that you mentioned that uh, Dr. Holman and our colleague, Dr. Kaylin O'Shea, uh, who's our graduate and now an assistant professor at North Dakota State, uh, we're uh, doing a second edition of the book um, called The Principal's Hot Seat, Observing Real World Dilemmas. And uh, that book, just in a quick summary, is uh, 15 authentic scenarios um, developed from a, a, a role play uh, it came out of a role play that I developed at, at Northern Iowa uh, where the principal takes on a role in a mock office and somebody comes to see her about a particular issue and that person is uh, pretty upset or concerned about whatever this issue is. Typically the principal student in the role of the principal doesn't know what the issue is in advance and so they're having a a conversation and sometimes it's really intense and really difficult and sometimes the guest is profane and aggressive and uh, just, uh, you know, a handful. Every principal I know has dealt with those kinds <laughs> of interactions more times than they can count. Yes. And so everything that I've written um, tries to get at the authentic day-to-day -day Thursday afternoon life of a principal and whatever might be uh, coming up uh, in that moment. And so uh, the, the book, the second edition that Shavana and Kayla and I are, are working on um, features 15 different scenarios. There's video footage uh, of the interaction. There's a transcript of the conversation between the two folks um, and some background information on whatever the issue is. You know, is it, uh, you know, my, my son was not chosen for the National Honor Society and I want to know why because he got straight A's involved in all kinds of activities and I thought everybody loved him. Well, what's the, what's the issue? Um, or, you know, um, you know, or the, the parent that's objecting to the presence of special needs students in the general ed classroom and while well, they're distracting my son, he can't concentrate because these special needs kids are in there. Okay, well, let's, let's respond to that in an ethical standards-based way. And let's also not put that on the special needs students who have every right to be there and who will be best served in that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy um, 
trying to give future principals um, authentic things to uh, try to get their heads around um, to make them better. Um, and and uh, that, that second edition book that we're doing, I know is going to be a whole lot better than the first because Shivana and Kaylin are helping with it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, it sounds it sounds uh, right up our alley, uh, both as a as a department and a program uh, to provide you know real world practitioners um, thinking and and experiences that you're gonna that you will see. <laughs> Someone will come in in your office upset about something you did, something you didn't do, <laughs> or something somebody else did, and you're gonna have to respond um, in that moment uh, in the best way possible. So sounds great. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, there's, there's not a, a, like, like Dr. Holman said earlier, there's, there's not a, you can't always look up what to do in the index of a book. It's art and science and who you are and the skills you have and your, um, your empathy and uh, willingness to start over, try again and a bunch of other things. Yeah. Well, thanks. Great. All right. So we have finished our questions and we're going to move on to what we call the red round. Red round. Red round. Okay. So the red round is basically a lightning round of questions. I'm just going to name you off two different things and you just tell us which one is your top choice. Okay. okay. This is this is terrifying. <laughs> Not terrifying. <laughs> is that because as a higher ed person, uh, <laughs> speaking for an, a long period of time is a norm. So this is this is uh, too restrictive. Yes. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's that. It's uh, what are the choices going to be? It's the recording <laughs> button. It's all of it. I mean, you played this with my daughter in China forever. <laughs> <laughs> now no, it's coming back. <laughs> this will be a little bit easier than her questions, though. <laughs> okay. All righty. So we have it set for about 10 seconds, but let's go. Scooby Doo or Foghorn Leghorn? Foghorn Leghorn every time. Text or talk? Talk. Magazine book. Book. Work or play. Uh, let's I, just go. I, I was about to say play. I think we all work plenty. All right. Let's I just think we going. work plenty. Big screen or on demand streaming? On demand. Shorts or pants? Shorts. Summer or winter? You know, that's hard because I like my winter clothes better, but you can do more in the summer. Summer or winter? Uh, quick, quick, quick. Summer. <laughs> Drive or fly? Drive. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pace, for being our very first guest on Lead Big Red podcast. Scott and I are very thankful for you devoting your time to share with us your, your leadership experience and knowledge and um, are thankful for, for your words of encouragement and everything that you shared with us today. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for asking. I know that the guests uh, get a whole lot better and more engaging and relevant from here, um, but I, I really appreciate being asked, and I'm so excited for this project and, and uh, just appreciative of the work that you two do because uh, there aren't two better leaders uh, to emulate uh, than the two of you, and so just thanks for being here and, and for all that you do Thank and, and you. for asking me. Absolutely. Thank you.